Security can't solve crucial problems when they have to wade through thousands of alerts a day. With ServiceNow, you can easily prioritize and respond to your most crucial business threats. That way you can go from overwhelmed to under control. ServiceNow brings security, risk, and IT together on one platform. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash ServiceNow. When it comes to modernizing identity, Active Directory just makes everything harder, from managing access for contractors and departing employees to securing cloud apps and on-prem systems. Your company deserves better. Choose Okta, the modern identity platform that securely connects anyone that touches your organization to any technology they want to use. Okta reduces AD vulnerabilities, secures not only employees, but contractors and customers, simplifies domain consolidation, and reduces your attack surface. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com forward slash Okta. Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. Quick announcement. Our next webcast is January 15th with Cecilia. How do you pronounce her last name, Matt? I was hoping Marin, you... Marinier. 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 Yes, thank you. Uh, the RSA Program Director, and uh, we'll be discussing Innovation and Scholars, where uh, the RSA Sandbox, RSA Innovation Sandbox, RSA Launchpad, RSA Security Scholar, uh, and their how-to seminar for innovators and entrepreneurs. Register for the upcoming webcast by visiting securityweekly.com and hitting the webcast drop-down menu and click registration. All righty. We're going to talk about Docker container security uh, and really just one aspect. I titled this Vulnerable from Inception. And it's actually not quite accurate a title. It's actually you can be vulnerable before inception. This is... Uh, actually going to show you a way to, if you're thinking about, which you should be thinking about, which Docker images you want to use, like from Docker Hub, uh, in your application, you can check to see if they contain vulnerabilities even before you use them and or on the fly. Now, there's lots of tools out there uh, that do this map. I'm sure you could probably rattle off a list off the top of your head, uh, both open source and commercial. I will show you an open source uh, tool from Anchor, uh, that will let you uh, basically look inside of the image before you deploy it, or even if you've deployed it already, you might want to look inside and see what kind of vulnerabilities lie inside. Um, now, I think a separate segment, Matt, and something I have not done yet is you can set up your own Docker registry, right? And yes. have it pull images from Docker Hub and modify them, customize them, update them, and then when you do your bills, you're pulling from your own trusted registry, right? So there's, I think, two benefits there. One is you get more control over what is inside all the images that you're using, and you can have your uh, builds only pulling from a trusted uh, registry, right? Yeah, and that's, there's yeah, two benefits is, there. Yeah, well, one of the th conversations we used to have a lot with the Layered Insight customer base was actually building their own instrumented container images in their own trusted registry, right? Yes. So you have large enterprises that are worried about the source of the, of the containers that are coming down. So they build their own trusted registries. And one of the things you can do with the Layered Insight solution is you can actually pre-instrument those. So you're handing the development teams kind of those golden images right. for your base container as a starting point. And that way you know and, and have control over a lot of the initial source code. Right. And that's that's a better way to do it and probably a whole separate segment on how to configure that. But And, and that's really for larger – it sounds like, Matt, that's larger enterprises are – that's where yes. they're either going or already are at, right? Yeah, I, I mean, a, a ton of organizations, large enterprises, have their own registries. That's where they're pulling from and have done some level of kind of validation on those initial images. They're not pulling directly from Docker or from some of the other uh, repositories that are out there. Gotcha. Uh, now, for the rest of us that maybe have not achieved that level of integrity or security, you may go out to the Internet and try and figure out how to build uh, a Docker container for your application. Uh, this example uh, happens to be Node. And um, you, when you pull, the internet basically gives bad advice. So when you look at, hey, here's how you build a container to run Node to be part of your application, there's a lot of issues with a lot of the examples that are out there. And I pulled one such example. Matt, I'm sure it, it, you're like ready to jump out of your seat looking at this Docker file, right? Because there's one glaring error that's a 
and again, another segment I think we'll probably do uh, is this container in this config will run as root, right? Which is something we, we get really mad about, I think, because we see it all the time. Right. That's a relatively easy problem uh, to fix, something you have to test, uh, obviously, in your, your build process, but um, the user directive will fix that. But one that might not be as obvious to some of us is the very first line in your Docker file where you're telling it what image to pull and where to pull it from. Uh, and that's what we're going to focus on today. And you may try and tell your developers, hey, you should be either have your own registry, right? Like we talked about just a moment ago, uh, or just use better images that are publicly available. And your developers may or may not listen to that, right? I think if you show them this, this segment and do this exercise, they'd probably be very interested in what you have to say, which is one of the reasons I wanted to uh, air it. So in this one, you can see the from line is pulling node colon eight. What that's gonna do is pull uh, Node.js version eight and whoever made that image, it was up to them what they included as the base operating system, right? So the problems are, well, really two problems. One, the version number is not specific enough. And I think uh, I'm more familiar with how this works in Python, right? Because if you just say, pull me Python three, random Docker image, not only do you have the operating system issues but what version of python 3 is it pulling is it 3.5 3.7 3.8 or maybe you're pulling it for a while and it's building you a 3.7 and one day they decide that it's going to pull the 3.8 is going to be included with it and then a bunch of your code breaks and that's bad so there's one reason to get your developers to really care about this one line uh in all of the docker files and that extends obviously out into kubernetes as well um now when the maintainer is choosing your base operating system, there's, again, a couple of issues with that. One, it may be a lot more software than you actually need. So your containers are going to be bigger, right? Which just, I mean, it slows down your build process, slows down your testing process, takes up more space as you have multiple environments that maybe you have images that are being stored on disk. It just, it's, they're larger images, right? More stuff than you need. Not only does that open up your attack surface, but there can be all kinds of vulnerabilities inside of these containers based on what the maintainer has decided to build into it. Um, so those the, are the issues that we're trying to solve. Yeah. The, the perfect example of this, the demo we always did at Layered Insight is we pull down PHP. Um, yep. Highly vulnerable first, but it also has a ton of Linux dependencies. So curl, shadow, yes. all these different libraries are embedded in that base PHP container image. And so to your point, Paul, if you don't need curl and shadow and all these other components, you want to get them out of your container uh, image, one, because it bloats the container size, but also you're now embedding all these potential vulnerabilities into your into your base container that you're, you don't need. They're, they're not right. there uh, and that's just for, more for any other purpose. Yeah, it's more applications, binaries, and libraries that could have a privilege escalation vulnerability, which could be really bad inside of a container environment, right? If someone were yes. to gain some type of command injection or, or command level access inside of your container through your application, which As, is pretty common and, still today. And especially if you're running root. And especially <laughs> if you're means, running PHP. <laughs> right, which means root access now gives you access back uh, into the environment, which now allows you to move right. laterally on that host into potentially other containers, which is why giving up root access is so bad and dangerous in this environment. Yes. Um, so there is, fortunately, better advice out there on the internet. Um, pythonspeed.com actually is the one that kind of made me realize the extent of all these issues, right? They wrote an article that basically said why you should avoid using most Docker examples on the internet. I'm like, oh, that's a great point. And they've got a very Python specific uh, examples there. And I, I will do more uh, on building a Python environment inside of containers because I, I did it wrong. I did it a little better. And then the most recent container environment I built, I thought came out much better from a security perspective. Um, and I will have an example of that probably in a, a future tech segment, which show it'll air on. I'm not sure, but I definitely have, you know, flagged that, um, that's a good article to read if you know, you have Python in your environment or are planning on it, uh, and want to look at some of the Python specific, cause there's different, again, the different frameworks and whatever language you're using, is going to change your, uh, container configuration. Now, uh, sneak. 
uh, who's a, now a sponsor. Is that that? Yes, that's correct. A sponsor uh, here on Security Weekly. They've got great advice um, and some awesome res- uh, resources on their website, including free tools uh, as well, which I did test out. Um, and I just wasn't ready to uh, present on them just yet. I have questions, not from Sneak, but uh, of the technology. Uh, John Kinsella, if you're listening, check your email. Um, <laughs> but uh, so we will talk more about uh, some of those vulnerabilities, specifically with, with Node uh, and React, which is what I'm uh, testing and working with now. Um, but Sneak had, I thought, one of the best articles on like things to consider when you're building your containers. And had some great data to back that up. Um, and they've, of course, looked at, same, similar to Layered Insight, right, Matt? They're looking at the number of OS vulnerabilities in these publicly available Docker images uh, and publishing a great report on it, as well as a great post that gives you things to think about with uh, the things you need to do to fix it inside of your container. Some of those things are easy. Like this segment is a pretty relatively easy thing uh, to fix, right? Uh, unless you're building your own trusted registry, which is a little more involved. Some of the other things in this article, uh, using some alpha features of Docker to implement secrets, which again, we're, we're also working on a segment for that as well. Um, but there, there is better advice out there. Um, so right. your developers or you know, your audience may ask you to, uh, to prove it, right? Like why, why should I spend all of this time with all like all of these little configuration items like basically what i found is most of your directives in your docker file have implications for the security the integrity and the reliability and performance of your application uh so these are all things collectively in your sec devops uh teams that you should be focusing on and this is matt i think regardless of where you're deploying right like if you're responsible for the container I think maybe serverless aside, although that configuration is separate, it, this is like the, the, the base, the first thing that you should focus on, right? Because you may deploy them locally, you may deploy them in uh, you know, multiple different cloud providers, but this is kind of step zero, right? Yeah, pretty close to step zero, right? It, it, there, there's an interesting handoff from when development develops in the IDE, right, in their code, and then puts it into a container. Um, so th- there's two points where you can actually do this. One is your base containers before you even start building anything. And I would say that's step zero. Mm-hmm. Some organizations do it, especially when they build their own trusted registries, is they're looking at that base container image as a starting point to make sure it's pretty secure before they hand it to the developers to put their custom source code in. The, the second time you get to touch this is when you build that container, right? So it's part of the build process and you're building um, the container image with your custom source code in there, you could also scan your source code prior to it going into that container. You rescan that image again as part of the build process because you want to make sure you didn't, the development teams didn't introduce any additional libraries or binaries that are vulnerable. So there are potentially two places to do this, Paul. Yeah. Um, Well, it's a great point too, because in, in a, I'm, I'm not very clear on exactly how to do this, right? But uh, I think more mature organizations, you're going to build in some debugging tools, maybe some different tools, like you might build Netcat and, you know, Telnet or whatever into your containers uh, to have uh, testing, right? When you're in development, right? To test connectivity. And then as you progress in your deployment, you're slowly starting to strip those things out. So when it reaches production, it doesn't have any of that extraneous stuff in. So you're gonna have different profiles. I think Kubernetes is probably uh, a better topic to talk about that, you know, that progression where your production environment, you're getting a slightly different config. Now, but every time you change that config, it has to be tested, right? If I'm removing yes. packages from, or libraries from my code or containers, uh, I wanna make sure that goes through a regression test to make sure I didn't break something. Um, so I, in this example, I use Anchor. I, again, Matt, there's a lot of different uh, you know, tools out there to test various aspects of your containers, uh, both open source and commercial. Uh, Anchor was just the one I found that I thought was, was pretty cool. Uh, so it allows you to scan your, not just your images, but any image for vulnerabilities and do a comparison. So I thought it would be fun to, uh, to look at if I were to build my uh, test app that I have today, which is a test React app uh, with Node 8 
versus the one that I chose, which is uh, 10 Buster Slim, which is Debian, uh, which is Node version 10, Debian Buster, and the Slim version, which is a much smaller uh, container. So Debian and Ubuntu, a lot of them have like the larger container environments. And then if you add dash Slim right in your from line, uh, you get a much smaller trimmed down container images. Um, the other one you can use is Alpine, right? Now, and I, I haven't done a full investigation, but what we've researched so far is that Alpine, it doesn't use libc. We've talked about this, I think, uh, mm -hmm. previously with uh, the folks from Cystic, Correct. right? Uh, yep. So in production, a lot of people don't recommend to use Alpine. You may see some examples that use Alpine. Um, I prefer to base mine on Debian, uh, just in my research. Your mileage may, may vary. Um, and, the, and the reason is, I think it's, it's important to uh, get into this a little bit, Paul, for the audience, is there are a lot of technologies that leverage libc uh, from an instrumentation and or an audit perspective. Yeah, so your security and, tools, right, need libc. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of security tools that need some aspect in access mm -hmm. to libc in, in Alpine where you don't have that. Um, there are techniques. I just don't know how well adopted they are by some of the different security players mm -hmm. in those types of environments. So that's why a lot of people prefer libc because there's already tools, security tools out there that can wrap libc and, and do some things for you. Um, so this is my little anchor uh, cheat sheet, very much based on their documentation. Uh, this is really pretty much exactly how I got it up and running in my environment. Um, now, I will make these slides available um, but they'll probably live on like our insider website. So if you want these slides and the cheat sheets that we're doing in our tech segments, I'm advising people to join our mailing list, uh, securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. And joining the listener interest there, right, we'll get them on the, the list. And we will make an announcement as we're working on building our insider site, which will have some of the extended content from our uh, from our segments. You can always go to the YouTube video uh, and, and see what's on my screen right now, but if you want the slides and additional materials, uh, we are working on building a site for that. Uh, so we do have a little cheat sheet. Again, you could probably, most of you could probably read the documentation that I read uh, and get uh, Anchor up and running. It basically installs and deploys just like, a doc like in Docker containers on your local system. Uh, and then there's some specific commands that you'll see in here to, um, download uh when you get the containers running the first thing the anchor containers are doing is pulling down all the vulnerability feeds right i'd imagine they had a similar thing to like what tenable had right they know all the linux distributions you can look at all the cves and based on the packages that are inside of them and the versions infer which cves are um uh, applicable to which versions of all of those images right so it takes some time to download that uh download that data um, you can check the status of those downloads because basically when it first spins up, nothing's going to be working because it's downloading all the vulnerability data. Uh, so once that finishes, and it doesn't take that long, um, you then uh, can check an image with those three commands at the bottom, right? So you add the image. So I added the Docker uh, node colon eight image uh, into my uh, anchor system. And then you run the wait command and you can kind of check its status. So now yeah, I've pulled in that node eight uh, Docker image and Anchor is now looking at it and determining what all the vulnerabilities are in it. Uh, so you run the wait command to see your progress that finishes. Then you run the vuln command and that displays all of your, uh, the vulnerabilities inside of that image. You can do this before you decide which uh, image you want to use uh, inside of your builds. I would imagine even if you had your own trusted registry, right, you could probably benefit from uh, Anchor, either open source or probably enterprise and their commercial offerings as well to do this as you're building your trusted containers for your environment as well. Uh, so like I said, it takes time. This is just what it looks like when um, you, you've you downloaded this uh, image into Anchor uh, and it'll just retry and say, yeah, I'm still scanning it, still scanning it. And then it tells you when it's done, which is really nice. Um, so, uh, what I thought was interesting is as a security professional, right, you're going to your dev team, you're bringing up all these issues. And if they say, well, we're running, you know, the node eight is what we're running. Now you can either have them run it or show them like, okay, here's all the vulnerabilities in this one and look at the list. And you know, the first thing that pops out is, well, there's two critical severity vulnerabilities listed inside of this image. And this was yesterday, right? I pulled this image yesterday and ran the scan yesterday. Uh, it gives you the vulnerability uh, URL. 
uh, in the CVE number. Uh, so there's some criticals, there's some highs, there's some mediums, there's some lows in here. It tells you exactly which package and which CVE is in fact vulnerable. So then the next logical question is, well, what vulnerabilities are in the one that I chose, which was node colon 10 Buster Slim, uh, which is which is my choice. I've been using a lot of the Buster Slim uh, images for the different languages and frameworks. And you get a lot less vulnerabilities, and I'll show you the stats next, a lot less vulnerabilities, and the severity is negligible on all of them for Buster Slim. Now, I don't think in, they've inherently built in more security. They're just, it's a lot less packages they're loading, <laughs> right? If they don't have Python 2.7 sitting in it, which is a big chunk of what yes. was showing up as criticals and highs, right? right? They probably extracted the Python library out as a dependency, and therefore they eliminated a whole class of vulnerabilities. Which is interesting because I'm building this as a node app server. Why would you need Python in it? Again, that's the package maintainer had built that into the previous uh, image, but you don't need it. My app runs just fine. I've got a very basic React app, right? It just it builds up a very basic form. I'm trying to learn how to code in React, which I, I realize I have to learn how to code in JavaScript, uh, which is really weird, I've found, when you're coming from other languages. Um, but my app runs just fine uh, with, with these uh, new configurations with these slimmed down uh, images. So... If you look at the total number of vulnerabilities, so I just did a quick uh, scan, so a vuln scan of each of the Node 8 and the uh, 10 Buster Slim, there's 2,386 vulnerabilities identified if you're using from Node colon 8, and only 75 if you're using Buster Slim. So just by making one small change in your Docker file configuration file, you've eliminated you know, uh, over 2,000 vulnerabilities inside of your Docker containers and greatly reduced your attack surface. I think also made it a lot more uh, better performance um, and probably better performance not just in your app, but when you're doing your CI CD pipeline and pushing all these images around, right, and doing the builds, that's going to happen a lot faster. So I thought that was a really cool exercise. And something I hope that, uh, you know, security teams can use to talk to your devs about, you know, how you're building your base images. Yeah, that's a 30x improvement. Right. Just by changing 30, that one, that's just one directive X. in right. there. <clears throat> so if you start doing this across, right, let's so say you got Kubernetes or you're, you're using a cloud-based service that's uh, providing you with Kubernetes, right, going through and doing this, this exercise, maybe before you start, right, Maybe building your own trusted registry, uh, I think, is something that enterprise software teams certainly need to be aware of. Because now you multiply that out times however many containers that you have in all the different applications. That's very, very significant from a reducing your attack surface uh, perspective. Yes. One of the other tools, Claire, is the other yeah, open source one. tool that does this uh, for people listening at home. There's a number of commercial products. And the advantage that the commercial products have a little bit over the open source, just, just to put it out there, is they've added some additional uh, vulnerability sources outside of the open source tools so you can get yep. a little broader coverage. They've also done a lot to speed up those scans and make them mm -hmm. a little faster than maybe what you're getting in the open source. But you showed a great example of how you can leverage either Anchor or Claire to do very simple checks uh, of your Docker containers. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I even think if you're a security professional and you're, you have an application, you wanna put it inside of containers, now you have some tools to make a better decision as to which you know, um, images to use for your own tools if you're not developing an enterprise application, right? Yep. Awesome, with that, we'll take a short break and come back with the folks from RSA Conference. Stay tuned.